Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Jonah. Welcome back to my ray tracing series. Got a quick one for you today. See what I did there? Quick one, because we're going to be making this faster today. Now, last time we talked about emission and emissive materials. I'll have that video linked up there in case you haven't watched it yet. Highly recommend you do. It's kind of a good summary of what we've achieved so far in this series. So if, you have, if you're kind of trying to get back into this, then it's a good place to rekindle the series. Right, so at the moment, this is what we're dealing with. Uh, if we just launch the application, we've got this. We did make a bit of a different scene last time, but we just did that by manipulating these controls. Speaking of which, we probably should introduce a way to kind of save scenes and maybe customize things like the skylight. That's probably something I want to do fairly soon. I just don't know how it fits into this series because it's going to be mostly like just an episode about UI and like serialization and stuff. So I'm, I, I don't know. But anyway, uh, you can see while I've been talking, this is accumulated nicely and it looks pretty good. Now the frame time here actually isn't too bad, but you can see that we're getting like around, if I just pause it for like a second, we're getting around 20 milliseconds or so, 19.5 milliseconds per frame. Um, and then, you know, like moving around the camera is not too bad. I mean, it's spiking maybe up to like 25 milliseconds. Of course, it's going to entirely depend on what your setup is like for your scene. If you've got more spheres, if they're potentially bigger spheres and they cause more bounces, you're going to obviously slow down that kind of frame time. But the main reason why I even wanted to kind of come in here and speed this up is because the next major thing that we're going to be exploring is like the specular component of all of these lighting calculations. What you saw in that kind of rendering just there was diffuse only. Now, specular is an entirely different ball game. I would say it's definitely more complicated than just diffuse. And that's definitely gonna bring down our performance, gonna make things a little bit harder to kind of work with. And of course, one of the goals of this series is we wanna keep things kind of more or less real time. So we end up having these kind of episodes where we go in and we're like, eh, let's just make this faster. So I was thinking about what the kind of slow parts were in general. I think we kind of know from the last Last time we sped things up that this kind of random number calculation that's really that was the bottleneck and the way that we're actually generating these random numbers is by again using like the c++ kind of random number generation engine which is definitely not uh, particularly performant. We had an episode a while back where we added this thread local keyword to the random engine. I'll leave the link up there in case you want to check it out. That definitely sped things up because when we added multi-threading in the first place, and this wasn't exactly thread safe, it was causing some performance issues for us and that definitely helped. But the presence of this engine in the first place presents a few different issues. Again, the first one being performance. It's not really like the random generation that we might need either. It's important to consider the fact that like, at the end of the day, we're creating images and of course we want them to be realistic, but it's kind of like, you know, why are we even using random numbers? We're not using random numbers where we're like really, really pedantic about that kind of statistical kind of random distribution. And it's kind of like maybe like the lottery. I, I mean, I don't know how the lottery works to be honest, but I, I assume that like, it's really important there that things are kind of random because if they're predictable in any kind of way, that breaks everything, right? People are gonna game the system, take advantage, and it's not kind of fair. Uh, ray tracing, <laughs> different entirely, right? Like, I mean, does it even matter if these numbers are truly random? Yes and no, because if we wind up tracing the same paths over and over again, because there's a predictable sequence, that's wrong because we're not going to evaluate as many different light paths as we could. And what that means is we will get a noisier image. We will get a worse result over time. And I mean, it will probably end up being a waste of time if we keep kind of just recalculating the same results where we could be tracing new paths and figuring out new kind of, you know, light areas. And similarly, the distribution of these random values is also going to kind of matter because that can affect the quality of our rays. But again, we're not trying to be uniformly random anyway. We're trying to weight things in a certain way that is going to contribute more important samples. So that's kind of the first problem with this kind of like random situation that we have, right? The fact that it's not very, it's, it's slow. The second problem is that clearly this is part of this C++ like standard library. Now our end goal for this series, like, I mean, really the end game is to run this, but on our GPU using Vulkan ray tracing, right? So we want to be able to use like the ray tracing cores inside our GPU and like the Vulkan ray tracing API to actually just generate this image. So that's kind of like the end game. But I mean, even like the intermediate game, the middle game, I'll say, which I'm not 100% sure if we'll end up doing. It depends on what you guys want, really. But I was going to take like this code and just move it onto the GPU, but just have it run as a compute shader. So not full on like ray tracing shaders, but just as a compute shader in Vulkan. Now, when slash if we do that, but either way for the end game, you know, when we start running this on the GPU in shaders, we clearly aren't going to be able to use this because this isn't like 
this is part of the C++ standard library. And GLSL, or like shading languages in general, they don't have like random number generators. And so my point is, we're going to have to switch to a different system anyway. And obviously like the functions that we use to generate random numbers or pseudo random numbers, obviously is what I'm talking about. It's all pseudo random. I mean, they're like, intrinsically those functions are kind of built with like no global state in mind or anything because they're used in shaders which of course are dispatched like in parallel so they're actually really useful and really compatible to use with what we have right now and it's as simple as just dropping them in so that's what we're going to do today we're going to take a look at a way that we can generate pseudo random numbers with a rather simple function just by having like an input seed doing some stuff to it and then getting like a kind of a random ish result that will be good enough for what we intend to use it for and and that will hopefully speed up our rendering. But before we jump into that, I want to thank Brilliant.org for sponsoring this video. Now, Brilliant.org is an amazing website filled with lots and lots of really high quality courses on various STEM topics. It's my go-to place to direct you guys if you want to learn math. All the way from beginner level, so if you're like, if you've never done math before, be scared of math, whatever it may be, their everyday math course, fantastic, really good place to start. But then also getting into some more advanced topics that will be useful for this series, such as linear algebra and calculus. Why Brilliant? So many reasons. First of all, each lesson is bite-sized. It's small enough that you don't have to allocate a whole lot of time to just get through it. Secondly, the way that they present it is just really kind of fun. Like I genuinely enjoy learning and going through their content. And really, I think the reason for that is because they present everything very visually and not just visually, but also interactively. Like they have these widgets that you can play with that show you how like the numbers work and how the thing that you're learning works. And learning math visually, like I feel like that's pretty much a requirement. I mean, think about why we even use graphs in math. Like we could just look at numbers, but graphs tell us much more, don't they? And the reason for that is because we're not like, we're not computers. Like numbers are cool, but it often makes a lot more sense to kind of see everything visually. And that is how Brilliant teaches you. Now Brilliant at the moment have a 30 day free trial. So you can just jump in for 30 days and check out everything that they have to offer for free. Just go to brilliant.org slash the channel. Link will be in the description below. Brilliant have also been nice enough to offer the first 200 subscribers 20% off an annual membership. Huge thank you as always to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. All right, so how are we gonna generate random numbers? There are a few different functions we could use here. A really, really popular one that honestly I've seen used everywhere is something called Wang Hash. I'll put it up on the screen for you. I feel like this has been like one of the go-to random functions and shaders that I've seen in a lot of different places. Most recently I've seen it in some Nvidia samples. I'll briefly explain how a function like this works. Basically, you can see that it returns like a uint and it takes in a uint, which is the seed. So it takes in some kind of seed and it does all of these operations to it and then it returns it. So the idea here is that you start off with some kind of unique seed. You need to have some something that identifies that shader dispatch in a unique way. So the idea is if you were using this in like a fragment shader or a compute shader, you could, for example, just use like the pixel ID. Obviously with the compute shader here, we're assuming that we're running it across an image or something. So we have that kind of pixel ID. So like in our ray tracer, if we take a look at per pixel, like it could literally be this X and Y coordinate, kind of like we're using here, right? But then we're also accumulating this over time. So we wouldn't just want to use like this, right? Because that means that every frame when we try and accumulate a new image, we would get the same result over and over again. But we can kind of break it up by using this frame index. So if we combine like the frame index with this, and then also it depends how many bounces we have because each bounce should kind of be unique. Hopefully you're kind of getting the point. Like we can put together, we can craft a number here that is gonna be almost like a unique index for that particular path or array. And once we have that, we can fit it in as the seed to this function. It's gonna do a bunch of random stuff to it and then spit out a uint. Now that uint is going to be basically a random number. We obviously wanna deal with random floats. So we're gonna just have to divide that by like the max value of a uint, which is like 4.2 something billion. And then we'll get a value between zero and one. Now we're not gonna use Wang hash specifically because Wang hash uh, is both a little bit more complicated than it needs to be. It's more cycles, more operations. And then also it's not very statistically distributed well. Instead, there's something else that we can use called PCG. This is both like a PRNG function and a hash function because it's so good. As far as I'm aware, it's superior to Wang hash in every way, both in performance, but also 
massively in statistical distribution. I'll link some articles below that kind of talk about this. They're basically my source for this. That's what I'm basing my claims on. So if you want to read a little bit more, links will be in the description below. Okay, so now that we kind of understand the theory, let's just go ahead and implement this. I'm just going to go up to this render.cpp file and just implement it here under the utils section. I kind of like the idea of almost treating this like a shader ish so that like everything is just in this one file and you can find everything you need here i don't want to bounce around too much so let's go ahead and write out this function pcg hash okay and i mean that's kind of it like if you look at this in terms of what this is actually doing so it's taking in that kind of input seed it's multiplying it and adding some like magic numbers. We're doing some bit shifting and some zoring. This is the extent of that random number generation, right? So in terms of like what our CPU and then later our GPU has to do, this is, it's all here. And it's going to be massively more simple than this whole random engine setup that we used to have. Now, obviously this gets us a uint, a random uint. We are looking for a float between zero and one because we want it to kind of like work the same way that this float works. Like this random float that we used to be using as part of like VEC3 and then this in unit sphere function. So you can see what this does. It just takes a distribution from that random engine, casts it to a float. So this is just gonna be like a uint. And then we're dividing it by uint32 max, numerical limits uint32 max. So the maximum possible value of a uint32t and obviously casting that to a float as well so that we get a float division. One of these needs to be a float for that or both. And this obviously winds up giving us a float between zero and one. So if we were to implement that here, we could just write static float. I don't know, let's just write random float. Now what we're gonna take in our seed and I'm going to take it in as a reference here because we actually want to kind of override it. So we're, not, we're never going to call this function outside of this function, but you can see that this takes in that input and then returns it. And that return value basically becomes our new input or our new seed. So to make that work, I'm actually going to set seed equal to PCG hash seed, right? So what I'm doing is I'm overriding that value of seed to something else. Now, because it's a reference, it means that if I call this random float function and I pass in this kind of state every single time, I can just repeatedly call it and I'll keep getting random numbers. And the reason why it's parameterized like this, of course, is just to get rid of this whole global state situation. We don't want that because obviously our algorithms here are running in parallel and on the GPU, they're going to be even more parallel basically because here we're running, I don't know how many cores, we have like eight cores or whatever. On the GPU, we have like eight and a half thousand cores, well, at least on my 3080. So it's a bit of a different ball game and we definitely want this to be not dependent on each other, hence the kind of parameterization. But this is basically the state of our random number generator. Now that we've done that, all we have to do is like we've generated that random number. It is the seed basically. So let's go ahead and just divide seed by, if we go back here, uh, this. So it's obviously the same data type. Uh, the alternative, I still don't know which one I prefer, honestly, but of course there's also this macro called UN32 max. Um, int save. This is like more of a C way of doing it, but you can see that you still get like the maximum value as an unsigned int 32, right? So that it's the same thing. And you can actually see that in this implementation, at least in the limits kind of library, I'll just put this over here so you can see this is, this is the limits header file. It's just returning that as well. I mean, it's not the 32 max, it's the uint max, but it's just that. So use either of these, honestly, this is the more C++ way of doing it because it's in a C++ header as opposed to a C header, but whatever. I don't know if it's worth me including stuff like that, by the way, maybe it's a waste of everyone's time, but I don't know. I just feel like I should mention something when I write certain code and I think about why I've written it. All right, anyway, that's done. So now we just have a way to generate random flow between zero and one. Now, if we look at what we were doing though, with this kind of in unit sphere function, right? What that did is it generated a VEC3 between negative one and one, which just calls float, but then multiplies it by max minus min and all that to get it into a different space. But really that just calls float three times for the X, Y, and Z component. And then we normalize it. So if I just take this function, we're gonna go back here, I'm gonna paste it in. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to call GLM VEC3 here. We're just gonna make a new VEC3 here that's gonna call random float. Now we'll need some kind of seed as an input. So I'm gonna go ahead and put that in here. We'll call random float three times, but we're gonna multiply it by two and subtract one. So that's just gonna get it between that kind of negative one to one space instead of zero to one. And we obviously have to do that per component. So we'll copy and paste that a couple more times. And that's it. If I just drop this down, so it's a little bit more visible. This is what we've 
created, do something fancy like that. And because this seed gets written to by this function, each function call here is in fact going to give us a different value. It's not like we need to write to seed ourselves. It gets passed by reference. Okay, so that's it. That's our in unit sphere function, which gives us a vector, obviously just kind of more or less uniformly distributed along the sphere's surface pointing into some kind of direction. We are going to eventually change this by the way. Obviously this is just like a, an easy kind of hack way of getting this to work. We'll probably change this soon to be like a more serious I guess way of doing this maybe like a cosine weighted distribution instead of this kind of random one at the moment okay so I I would love to compare the performance here so instead of just changing this straight up I'm actually going to go to our walnut app here uh, and actually no let's go back for a second let's go into our render settings here and I'll make a boolean here called slow random we'll just leave that as true uh, by default and then we'll go to walnut app and we'll find the place that we do all of our I'm GUI stuff so we have a checkbox here called accumulate let's duplicate that and make a checkbox called slow random. And we'll just obviously get that to manipulate the slow random variable inside our render settings. And then back here, I'm just gonna make an if m settings slow random, we'll do that. Otherwise, let's do our new fast way, which again, all we're gonna do is replace this existing function with utils random float. Now, the seed, the most important kind of part of this. So let's go ahead and write seed for now. We obviously haven't made that yet. So let's go up and I'm going to create a seed here. So this seed variable, I'm just gonna set that to be this to begin with. And then I'm gonna take seed, I'm gonna multiply it by the frame index over here. And I'm not exactly going for like 100% uh, unique index per frame, but this will be good enough. And then over here, we're just gonna add in that bounce kind of index, right? I is like our bounce index. So what this is basically gonna mean is we're gonna have a unique seed per pixel per frame of like accumulation. And frame index, by the way, starts at one. So don't worry about this making it zero across all pixels for the first frame, it won't. And we have a unique seed kind of per bounce. Now it is possible that they're gonna overlap between certain pixels. Like if, if this is like pixel index one, we times it by one, we get one, we double it, we get two. Like there's gonna be some overlap. So this isn't perfect, but it will be good enough. All right, that sunset's getting getting bright and warm. I like it. All right, anyway. Um, yeah, so that should be good enough. Let's just run this. All right, so hopefully you can see that last round of time here is um, like 15 milliseconds. I got slow random checked. Let me uncheck that. Okay, so that hasn't worked. Random in unit sphere, obviously is what I meant. So let's hit F5. Let's see what happens. Hopefully this is correct. All right, so here we have around 17 milliseconds per frame with the slow random. Obviously it's kind of variable here. And if I uncheck that, you can see we go down to around 13 milliseconds per frame. And of course this is gonna depend on how we kind of move around. Uh, it's gonna definitely depend on our scene. But the cool thing is, like as I kind of zoom in here and I go between the two randoms, the distribution you can see is actually like, I mean, I can't really tell the difference. And hopefully you can kind of see the difference here in performance. So here we are sitting around 10 milliseconds or so with slow random on. And then if I shut it off, you can see we never really hit that 10. So on off. Now, as I mentioned though, this is based off of a sequence of predictable numbers. What that means, and one way that we can see that clearly, is if I uncheck accumulate, this doesn't change frame to frame. But if I check slow random, it does. That's because we are generating completely different random numbers with their own kind of state per thread every single time we go through that kind of slower random path. Whereas here, we are going through the same sequence of numbers every single time. So you just have to be aware of the potential consequences of that. But you can see that if I do check accumulate, like the difference between these two is absolutely not apparent. And we definitely will be changing it slightly as well in the future, of course. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you did, please don't forget to hit the like button. Now, whilst this performance improvement might not be that dramatic, the cool thing that we've done here is that we're generating our own random numbers. Like we don't rely on the C++ standard library anymore. And the reason why that's useful is because it's gonna make our lives a lot easier when we do in fact move to the GPU in the future. Thank you all for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.